dairy industry has tremendous potential to grow but substantially also carries a lot of scope of mishandling so india is one of the largest milk producer uh, one fourth of the global production uh, that's around 22% and around 1% exports showing huge potential. And it's essential that we take uh, proper care and food safety seriously for us to grow. Talking about the topic, we have a very knowledgeable panel who has been, who has like a deep understanding and vast experience in dairy sector. Each one of them is an integral part of the ecosystem and essential to help you navigate through the system. So we have Dr. Surendranath, who has worked in scientific service, agriculture research service, in the discipline of dairy chemistry at Southern Regional Station of ICAR NDRI Bangalore. His 37 years of career was completely dedicated teaching and extensive research, publishing almost a decade, uh, century, around 90 national and international journals, three patents, 24 research projects, and he's been a project guide uh, to the PG and doctoral students. And I think the list goes on and on, right? So next on our uh, panelist, we have Mr. Prasant Bhatt. He carries a rich experience of 25 years in R&D, uh, sector commercializing manufacturing operations and flavor applications in various leadership roles. He also possesses deep experience and knowledge in product and process of a dairy, juice, sparkling beverages, nutrition products, etc. He joined Mother Dairy as chief R&D officer in Feb 2019. He and his team is responsible for creating the dairy strategy developing innovations and successful execution, identifying and executing productivity initiatives. So he's also a key contributor in building dairy and plant protein, which is the in thing today, right? For his uh, company, which currently stands at approximately $2 billion. Next on our panelists, we have uh, Mr. Pratipal Singh, a postgrad in process engineering from Charles Darwin University, who currently is working as a process engineer at Denon Australia, carries 10 years of experience in dairy manufacturing. Preet joined Denon since its establishment in 2011 in Australia. He has uh, played a major role in successful commissioning of Denon plant in Australia and handle various projects and facility for the operations. Next on our panelist, we have Mr. Milton, who's a dairy technologist with an MBA from NDRI, Karnal, and heads the operations at Osam. Currently, uh, he's heading as a COO and has a rich experience of over 25 years, effectively leading all business related operations of dairy industries under cooperative and private sectors. He has basically led a group of 1000 plus workforce and worked as consultant for Meda for three years. He has also been associated with Amit Press as business head, Vadilal as general manager, and Sudha Dairy as chief executive. And I am Sarika, founder and managing director of Food Safety Works. We help food businesses with design, planning, production, product productization, basically. We also help meet the regulatory uh, requirements as well as different food standards. I will be moderating the panel today. And over the next one hour, we'll hear the practitioners about the challenges in the sector and what we can do to mitigate the challenges. We will definitely allocate some time for audience questions. In this, uh, so could request you to please type your questions into the chat window as we go along, and we'll try to pick up at the end of the session. So we'll start with our uh, conversation today. So the first question we would like, Dr. Surendranath, it's for you. Uh, so FSSAI had conducted a survey in 2018 on milk safety and quality, 
and had released a report in 2019. Uh, that's when we saw that the milk is adulterated, contaminated, and it was pretty much prevalent in the market. So what do you think are the issues that can be, uh, you know, about it? Over to you, sir. Yeah, good morning, uh, organizers of Food Safety Works and uh, fellow panelists and participants as well. So as Mr. Sarika mentioned, that milk is one food which is consumed by all in everyday diet in predictable quantity. Like infant to invalid, young to adult, everyone consumes milk in one or the other form. As a matter of fact, in food safety basket, if you see, after cereals, our major expenditure is towards milk. In India, it is estimated approximately 16 to 20% of our food basket expenditure goes for milk and milk products next to two cereals, which is about 30%. So considering the fact that it is such an important food, a dietary item in every day's, every person's diet, that its quality and safety are of paramount importance. And, uh, you know, nowadays in social media, a lot of information is being spread. Miss or correct information, we really do not know. So a lot of information is being spread about various aspects, including that of milk and milk products. Food Safety Standards Act, which has been uh, kind of approved in 2005, came into implementation in 2011, has got onus on monitoring the quality and safety of milk and milk products. So in 2011, they did a survey wherein, uh, you know, they kind of, uh, uh, this is the question what Mrs. Sarika asked me. In uh, 2011, when they did a survey, which was not a very comprehensive survey, and then it was shown that most of the samples that they have analyzed, about 1,800 samples that they have analyzed, most of them were non-conformity. But if you mm -hmm. see the non-conformity issues, they're mostly you know, not meeting the fat and SNF. SNF means solids, not fat, like proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, et cetera, that milk contains in addition to fat. For analytical convenience, we consider milk to have two types of solids, fat and SNF. So when they saw that uh, most of the parameters that the milk did not conform to or with respect to some quality parameters. So they undertook a study in 2018, as Mrs. Sarika mentioned, a comprehensive survey, Pan-India, mm -hmm. considering taking both you know, raw milk samples from the unorganized sector as well as the organized sector. So like you know, processed milk, the processed milk means like typically what you see in the market, packaged milk, like toned, double toned, full cream, etc., as well as raw milk samples that are comprised of cow, buffalo, mixed milk, etc. So they analyzed all these samples of milk for various parameters. For the sake of understanding to all our general public, I would like to mention that there are two issues with respect to this particular survey. One is quality survey, another is safety survey. Quality means you know, like whether it meets the fat level, whether it meets the SNF level, which are stipulated by the legal uh, act, like Food Safety Standards Act, fat must be this much, SNF that this much, I mean, so on and so forth. So when they tested about 6,432 samples pan India, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. both raw as well as processed, they found that more than 50% of that really meets. And mm -hmm. remaining 50% that do not meet you know, are mostly with respect to non-safety issues. They don't complain with respect to non-safety issue. Like, you know, maybe fat percentage is a little less, SNF percentage is a little less, or they may contain some additives like sugar, maltodextrin, et cetera, which are not considered as a safety compliant, you know, safety non-compliance. Like they have a compromise with respect to quality. But then when they have also tested for uh, safety issues, like, you know, presence of antibiotic residues, they tested for a large number of, uh, like almost 93 antibiotic residues, 18 pesticide residues, oflotoxin M1, which could be present in milk because of feed consumption containing oflotoxins, and then certain other uh, unsafe adult trends like ammonium sulfate, urea, et cetera. They found that most of the samples do not have these kind of non-safety concerns. Like, you know, I will not go into the details because of paucity of time that, you know, five minutes are uh, allocated for this particular question. If you really see these slides that most of the samples do, uh, you know, kind of comply with respect to safety issues. Mm -hmm. So ultimately uh, the FSSA uh, concluded that, you know, milk in pan india uh, i mean against the, some of the reports that are present in social media that you know it is contaminated it has got safety issues etc they come out with a conclusion that most of the samples are not adulterated 
and they do not have any kind of safety issues especially the milk which is kind of processed and marketed by the organic sector by and large seems to be very very safe i also have a little bit of experience by visiting various organic dairies since they have a system in place maybe my other co panelist also will agree with me since they have a lot of systems like iso 9001 iso 22000 etc there is somebody who is monitoring like fssa or many other regulatory agencies or certifying bodies that uh, they kind of maintain the quality and plus for them itself their their, their image is at stake their marketing potential is at stake so they are generally the quality and safety of milk processed from the organic sector are coming out of the process I mean out of the organic sector is really good uh, and safe i must say i mean i can convene can I mean comfortably say that and then what needs to be done was another uh, particular uh, question that was posed as a part of that particular question as i have said milk is a food which is consumed by everyone and its quality and safety are of paramount importance considering the fact that it is consumed by every every individual in the family like an infant to invalid as i have said but having said that uh, you know fssa has conducted a survey and by and large it is considered safe that is not the end of the road because we need to continue this regular monitoring of quality and safety in india while fssa act and standard science based standards are imposed by the central agency at delhi in fda bhavan the implementation part is with state authorities so a regular monitoring and quality uh, of quality and safety of these important food item should be done by all the concerned legal and regulatory agencies so that we get uh, this important uh, item of food in our diet in a in a fairly in a safe fashion and with the desired quality that's what i want to say mrs sir Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so I think the assurance is given, saying like it's not about the safety, but it's more on the quality parameters, right? And also, I think sir mentioned saying like the onus is on the FBOs who's handling the milk, right? So now on to you, Mr. Prasant. Uh, you are uh, one of the top three dairy processing companies in India, right? What is your take uh, on the overall milk supply that you receive? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to Dr. Shashikant, uh, Ramesh, and Sarika for having me in this discussion. Uh, I work in Mother Dairy as uh, Chief R&D Officer. Um, so, uh, for those who may not be aware of our business, uh, we are part of uh, National Dairy Development Board (NDDB). Um, we are uh, around 11,000 crores uh, business uh, in in dairy as well as uh, in vegetable oil and fresh fruits and vegetables um, so our, our major presence has been historically uh, in in the north region in delhi and cr and now we are entering into new markets also um, so if you look at the overall um, milk supply in india uh, it is around say uh, 50 crore liters on a daily basis so 50 crore liters of milk is produced on a daily basis of that half of this 50 crores is consumed by the farmers for their own use and the remaining 25 crores uh, is converted into value added products or it it is sold uh, as a raw milk to the to the consumers uh, if you look at our company we we buy anywhere between 38 to 40 uh, lakh liters a day uh, of which majority of it goes uh, either in the pouch format or in the Um, in the BVM format, so that we call uh, BVM, which is uh, we call it as token milk, where uh, in our booths uh, the milk is uh, is um, uh, is is served uh, in in the in the utensils that the consumers bring. So the, it is not it is unpackaged format. It is it is pasteurized chilled milk. Served from the booth, and the consumer would bring their own utensils. So it is a package free uh, milk. and uh, that, that that constitutes around 30% of our total milk uh, sales and the remaining 70% is in the form of pouch milk so if you look at the the milk um, supply chain um, as we have been talking about uh, the food safety uh, issues um, uh, every batch of milk that we receive goes through more than uh, 35 tests and these tests include the parameters that influence the the consumers uh, uh, 
sensory preference as well as the parameters that 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 impact the food safety so if you look at the parameters that in, impact the food safety um, it has whole host of uh, adulterant testings then there are there are testings related to um, antibiotics aflatoxins pesticides etc Uh, so each batch of milk would go through all the tests, and then only it will be uh, processed. Um, and then there is the micro quality of the milk also is very important. Um, so all the manufacturers, uh, one of the key um, priorities would be once the the milking happens, the milk needs to be chilled as soon as possible. So once it is chilled, then the the microbial growth can be uh, controlled to a major extent, and then. once it reaches to the factory as soon as possible it has to be processed so th this is always the priority of uh, of of the of the supply chain um, for for any manufacturer uh, if you look at the adulteration uh, um, possibilities i think most of the the adulterants that are that that can be used by someone uh, get tested so uh, They, they they try to find new methods of uh, of adulterating milk but but we we also are all, always uh, we all we try to be ahead of that in terms of uh, devising the methods to test them um, as far as the other parameters which are more, mainly the monitoring uh, parameters uh, which is about antibiotics or pesticides or aflatoxins pesticides there is no issue as far as milk is concerned because um, i think many years ago there was there was certain issue which later once the farmers got educated around that so currently we have a zero uh, uh, zero occurrence of uh, any pesticides uh, in our milk when it comes to antibiotics um, that occurrence is, is very very small percentage less than 1% um, and the antibi if if we detect antibiotics uh, in in milk we reject that milk so we do not use it aflatoxin is is one of the issues because um, aflatoxins are in the food chain right so you do not add them it is in the food chain um cow would would graze on grass or say it, it has that that cow feed uh, and and there are several sources through which uh, uh, the mycotoxin b1 can come into uh, into the cow's body and then it gets converted into uh, aflatoxin m1 um so what what in 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 our in our company we have a quality program whenever there is a uh, this 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 aflatoxin comes in very very small uh, quantity like it is in ppbs uh, parts per billion so if if it is if it is detected then we we then identify which route it has come from and then in that area we go to the farmers and and talk to them and educate them how do we avoid or how do you minimize the the occurrence of uh, aflatoxins um apart from this like uh, the as far as the micro uh, quality is concerned it can be quantified to a major extent because micro test normally require 3 to 5 days uh, whereas there is a quick method called as mbrt test that quantifies the quality of incoming milk um and, and, and in summers normally due to the higher temperatures the the mbrt is lower as compared to winters um, but once it is pasteurized then the then the all the, all the micro load would significantly get reduced and then you supply the milk uh, to the consumers in the chilled format um and this 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 is one area that where every company would would keep on uh, improving its processes and systems because you need to very consistently deliver a safe product to the consumers and we have been doing that that's great uh, to know there's a continuous improvement uh, that keeps happening uh, you know folks at the farm level start uh, looking at the different adulterants and then uh, as a manufacturer you have to be way ahead of them to figure out all those adulterants which can go in so uh, preet uh, you heard about the challenges at the supply chain level that in india we have and for sure you don't face such issues in australia Uh, are there any other related issues that you face back in Australia with respect to contamination? Hi, I'm Fred, and I'm really glad to be on this panel. Thanks for inviting me. Um, 
just to give an understanding, the reason I'm representing today, um, there are around 1,300 farms around here, and it's the mill hub of Victoria, and the yearly production of around uh, two billion dollars of milk is produced around here. Uh, a bit regards to contamination, it uh, doesn't matter where you are. There's always risk of risk of contamination, and uh, it is probably one of the major reasons for recalls, which we often hear or read in the newspaper or um, watch on the news. So, but uh, we are lucky to, in this country, to have uh, strenuous um, uh, quality checks throughout the process. So as already been touched by Surendra Nath and uh, Dr. Prasad that um, a strenuous checks needs to be done. Um, so the contamination can occur anywhere from the farm to the receiving mills to manufacturing. Um, so we need to be, we need to be on top of uh, at every single stage. And uh, so just to ensure that we don't contaminate product, uh, uh, we carry various checks at various stages. So we monitor um, mill, um, mill temperature, storage time, pH, and just to name, just to name few. And all the quality testing are, are being clearly defined with the standard set parameters. And uh, in, in order to release the product, you must meet um, all those parameters. And uh, also, as from the uh, manufacturing perspective, um, contamination can also occur within the manufacturing. As uh, that's what Dr. Prashant said, it, uh, it can be sensory as well, like, um, where I work, we make heaps of products. There are certain products that have high protein, other are low protein, high fat, non-sugar, or sugar products. So, and uh, also allergens. So we have to make sure every different product is treated separately. We cannot contaminate one product with, uh, with another. Um, so this, so just to give you a bit of detail, so that can be from the manufacturing uh, perspective, that can be done during uh, the cleaning by increasing the time. So we, we usually work uh, cleaning by a uh, thing called tech. So you can um, control the risk of contamination by um, in looking at the time, um, action, concentration, and temperature, which uh, helps uh, immensely to reduce the contamination. But um, even though it's in Australia, there's always a uh, risk of uh, contamination, but um, we just have to be on top of um, the quality check and uh, make sure everyone in the milk supply chain to the manufacturing process are well trained and they are well aware of the risk. And um, yeah, so that's all I, all I need to add. Thank you. Yep. Oh, bye. Great. Definitely, yes, we have to be on top of, you know, everything uh, to avoid any contaminations that we have, right? Uh, so, uh, Mr. Milton, to you, so you have a dairy plant in Jharkhand and Bihar, right? Do you see a similar trend of contamination as well? And uh, apart from what Mr. Prasant had to say or Mr. Preet had to add, uh, what kind of additional monitoring do you suggest uh, to check you know, uh, this kind of practices. Uh, you are on mute, Mr. Milton. You may have to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So I'll try to cover all those. Uh, first of all, good morning, all participants, Sarita, Dr. Surudranath, Prasant, and uh, Preet. Uh, uh, Talking about me, I have a, I had a very, very long experience with dairy industry. I'm working on job since 1980 and uh, at different uh, positions, different responsibilities in uh, government organizations, cooperatives, as well as in private sector. So, uh, well, uh, when we talk of food safety in terms of milk, right, uh, we all know that milk is the best food on earth. Uh, it has almost all the nutrients, not only that it is present, it is present in the right quantity and the right configuration in milk. So to talk uh, about a few of them like milk protein, 
is the most easily digestible protein. You have protein from different sources, but milk protein is the most easily digestible protein. You have lactose. The milk is the only source for lactose, which is uh, a combination of glucose and galactose. It gives us energy as well as it improves our brain cells. Talking, talking of calcium, on dry matter basis, milk uh, uh, has the highest calcium presence on dry matter basis among all the other foods. So there are many, uh, we have all kinds of all required vitamins, minerals, everything. Now, when we talk of food safety, our requirement is to protect these nutritional facts right from the udder of the cow till uh, it passes through all the supply chain and finally it reaches the customers, right? So that is the big challenge under Indian conditions. We will talk in a, a little more detail on this. Uh, like uh, when you compare, uh, see the way milk is good for human being, it is equally good for bacteria. And once uh, the ideal condition, we all know this, that when the ideal condition is there, bacteria grow very fast in this. And they do two things. One is they spoil the nutritional quality of milk. And secondly, they spread uh, disease, the pathogens present in this, they cause disease to the consumers. Now that is a big challenge, how do we do it? Uh, if you compare the Indian uh, raw milk versus the raw milk of developed countries, there lies the challenge and there lies the, uh, there lies the place where we need to improve upon. Uh, you have crores of bacteria in Indian raw milk, whereas we have very less in thousands uh, in uh, the developed countries. Then why it is so? See, one is the reason can be the uh, uh, breed and the from the udder of the cow, we, uh, milk is almost the same. Problem is the our uh, way we keep our animals. Uh, the herd size in the developed countries is much more, so, I mean hundreds. Whereas our farmers have one or two, maybe three cows per farmer. Now what happens? This causes too much of contact surface per liter of milk. When small, small quantities are handled at different locations uh, by different farmers, it is likely to contaminate milk more. Then, of course, in uh, when you talk of developed countries, there is an instant chilling of milk. Just maybe at the farm, farm only they have the cooling arrangements and they chill it right there. But that, that facilities we do not have. We cannot expect our farmers to have BMCs for such small quantities. Now, these are the leads that we have where we need to work. See, we cannot have an excellent quality finished product with a substandard raw milk. Probably we need to work much harder. We have improved. Companies have improved. They have been doing working on this line but there is still a lot of scope to improve our raw milk qualities. First of all, it starts with uh, uh, the clean milk production uh, training to our farmers. We, uh, NDDB has been doing it since long, and but still it is very less. If you really try to understand the how many of our farmers really follow the clean milk production norms, I would not like to go in detail in that but there are processes, how, how to keep your herd, how to keep, maintain your cow, how to do the milking, what all precautions we need to take before we do the milking, the uh, cleanliness of the pail, then the milk, where we keep the milk before we shift it to the chilling centers. There are many things. Secondly, one thing is very clear that milk has to be chilled as soon as it is collected. Now, how do we do that? Because we have small, small farmers. We have villages all spread all around. We have very bad road conditions. Now, how do we ensure that all these milk gets collected and gets chilled immediately? So there we need to work maybe smaller bulk coolers, maybe 
bulk coolers nearer to most of the farmers then of course even the our payment systems still we are uh, going around fat and snf by quality most of people still understand only fat and snf it's a time we switch over let us make uh, fat and snf as a qualifying parameter but the payment should strictly be based on the bacterial quality of milk unless we make that change see when we are paying on fat and snf to our farmers even it gives rise to the adulteration people find ways how to get more fat and snf on the testing to get more payment since there is no payment in a uh, uh, penalty or reward involved with the bacterial quality uh, they are not bothered or they are not really serious about it so there are some fine tuning in my opinion is required once we are able to get a right quality raw milk at our dairy plant dairy plants of course it is not much of lacking we have been improving very fast still there are certain automations are required certain product developments are required certain quality checks needs to be improved the quality systems has to be followed more stringently not just just for the certification not just for the certification but in the real sense we need to follow the quality systems then when it comes the outward like uh, transportation from the dairy plant to the retail we have the problems of insulated vehicles people call it insulated but it is actually not insulated we need to have some kind of audit system to really check whether so called insulated vehicles are really insulated or not if there is any possibility of improvement there then the uh, audit of our sellers audit of our uh, retail points whether they are really maintaining the cold chain really maintaining the cold chain before it is served to the customers there are scopes for improvement on all these places i think i will uh, stop talking at this point these are the challenge places of challenge where we need to work to really compete we are the largest producer of milk probably the largest market as well but nothing happens without quality we need to improve our quality instantly and for that we need to improve our raw, raw milk quality to be more particular and we all of us need to work hard on that parameter thank you very much yeah so uh, continuing with you mr milton see another one for you saying like definitely yes infrastructure has been a challenge right which uh, i think we all have to work on but then yeah the climate conditions the weather conditions which are like you know aggravates right the quality goes bad during the uh, summer times which is especially tricky in india with no infrastructure available so what has been your experience in dealing with the situation or the milk quality during the summer times yeah uh, basically uh, only the outwards like once the product is manufactured and being supplied i i, I already talked like that insulated vehicle is a challenge you know we are we do not really uh, except for some good companies like amul and the uh, mother dairy most of the other uh, players in the uh, market are not very serious about really checking the insulation qualities right so that uh, gives rise to the temperature you know in milk once there is a rise in temperature and bacteria starts growing they spoil the product river just again chilling it does not help once the uh, damage done to the milk and well products cannot be reversed so that is what is happening you know when uh, here when we go to the market the retailers will say see my fridge is running see the milk is cold but the fact is in night they switch over the fridge to save the power so these are the things where we need to attack even the power uh, supply situations are not very good so of course i don't have a direct answer to your question because we cannot the change the country over overnight but we need to be careful on this with strict uh, supervision and training we are likely to improve on this we need to preach our farmers we need to train our farmers 
as well as our sellers about the quality of milk and milk products and just yes. cooling at the end does not help once the product has been spoiled just cooling at the end does not help you uh, reversing the spoilage yeah so definitely yes the raw material plays a major role right on how and what type of finished product comes out right and there are weather fluctuations in australia as well right and your largest product uh, which is yogurt uh pre to you how sensitive is it to such changes or any other environment factor that might contribute to the issue uh as we as few of you might know australia is a country of extreme weather here we have we have suffered recently with bushfires we have extreme heat we have drought we have floods and we get uh, extreme cold as well so obviously that will have a massive impact on the milk supply Okay, not not in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality as well. So as we are in a business of making yogurt, and we are all about getting um, better yield, but um, during the summer months um, we don't get the uh, protein as good would we get during winter when the pastures are green and the cows are fed more green pastures than as compared to summer. so we do have a variation in milk protein coming up um uh, during our uh, summer and winter months so to take that into account uh, we have to take a yearly average to work out our bonds which is called billing of materials to ensure um we it's not costing us extra to make um uh, your finished goods in certain months so we can take care of the environmental factors so even during budgeting the environmental factors um need to be taken care of and and also on the other hand the natural disaster can um uh, stop uh, or um the milk supply chain uh, as recently as last year this time last year we had a massive bushfire and we lost probably 25% uh, of our capacity because we couldn't uh um get the milk uh, in time so Yeah so environment has a massive impact um reducing the milk supply and it also impacts um the the quality of the product and um uh, with with the yogurt it all depends on uh, how how much milk protein you get so if we are not getting within a parameter so we also we have to top it up here uh with a uh, different process called the SMR and so it also adds to the dollar value for the uh, final product so yeah it does have a massive impact uh yeah so definitely i think the weather plays a major role right and i was just reading out somewhere and then it said saying like uh in india the milk in the morning is paid higher than the milk that comes out in the uh, evening right so uh, and then the people were started looking at saying like uh, do we uh, you know turn it into the produce like a product like a curd paneer cheese or something which can give them higher uh, you know input so uh, to you mr prasant uh, what is the effect of such environmental factors on other products like your curd paneer cheese uh, out there sure sure i think uh, uh, summer is a very difficult uh... time from a from milk supply chain perspective all right so the milk production goes down significantly and at the same time you need to um, chill the milk as soon as possible after its milking right so and uh, uh, our company's mission has been to um, to involve the poorest of the poor farmers um, because we we do not normally work with big farms we work with the individual farmers so a farmer would have just say two or three cows he would bring in 6 7 liters of milk max uh, on a daily basis to our 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 collection centers um, and then we work with like lakhs of farm farmers on a daily basis so once the milk gets collected uh, like you have got small pockets where there is a sahayak who would work with say around 200 250 farmers who bring milk on a daily basis to him it is it gets collected there there after testing and then it is sent to the chilling centers 
and as as uh, mr milton pointed out um, the infrastructure in terms of roads etc is not is not ideal right in villages so it takes time to reach milk uh, from the collection center to the chilling center so our priority is always has been how do we reduce that time and how do we do we add more um, uh, chilling centers so currently we have more than 350 uh, such uh, dispatch centers where where milk gets collected chilled and then sent to the factories um then once once it reaches the plant then like every, every manufacturer would have the best control on the milk quality um in terms of processing it and then delivering it to the consumer at the right temperature so from the factory it leaves uh, in in the right uh, temperature conditions but once it reaches the the retail shop um normally milk is sold uh, mainly in the morning and the evening right so you have those crates you can see the crates that are kept outside the shop consumers actually think that the milk that is kept in the crates outside is fresher than the milk which is there inside the refrigerator they always think that the milk has just now come and uh, we should buy this so the the type, kind of abuse that it goes through during summers is quite high the temperatures may may go up due to which the microbial quality normally comes down so we have been working on innovations like insulated crates um, the crates that can um, that can hold the temperature the cool cool temperature for a longer time so it's like 10 to 12 hours so even if you keep it outside in ambient condition the temperature of the milk doesn't go up but there is an inv- investment required in that we have we have been uh, introducing uh, uh, insulated crates in the market uh, over a period of time or normal crates would be replaced by the insulated crates where wherein we can have a better control of uh, the the temperature and as far as the products are concerned like we have got curd we have a whole range of products um, there the temperature uh, control is is quite uh, quite good uh, because we um, we supply those products in the refrigerated vehicles where the temperatures are controlled and uh, at, at the shop it is normally kept in the refrigerators so unless the shopkeeper puts off the the refrigerator in the night the the temperature would be still maintained um, in the case of like pouch formats of some of these products during the summers in the case of say chaach or lassi there may be slight increase in the acidity because of the temperature abuse um, and that could be taken care by um, using the right uh, cultures that do not produce acidity even at a uh, temperature abusive conditions so 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 those solutions we have we have found out so that um, consumer consistently get the the right taste and quality um, at at the front end okay so it's not only the infrastructure it's also the innovation that's required to make sure your product is yeah. safe which has left your premises and it's you know in a a uh, good condition that your consumers appreciate what they are getting so moving a little uh, you know making a shift away from the environmental factors which we have been discussing so this is for you dr surendranath um, fssai has listed contaminants contaminants right which includes your pesticides antibiotics uh, and do you think there are any other contaminants which need to be considered uh, safe for milk procurement and uh, how about your guidelines in india about the antibiotics yep there yeah there you go uh, this week yeah well you know just want to say uh, what mr milton and mr prashant as well as mr preet has added about uh, quality of milk you know milk uh, the safety and quality concerns start from the production or even pre production uh, time till it reaches the consumer it's not that at one point of time it gets contaminated as mr preet said it gets contaminated throughout the whole chain i would even say pre production i'll come to that when we talk about contaminants or antibiotics you see basically the quality of milk with respect to the bacterial growth as mr milton and mr prashant have mentioned that it needs to be checked and a lot of things a lot of improvements and innovations are being done in this particular respect that you know milk is being cooled uh, using bmcs in many areas many many dairies big dairies are taking very big lead 
in that particular fashion because they want to produce good quality products as mr milton mentioned you cannot make a good quality product using a bad raw milk so therefore a lot of efforts are going on and as mr prashant said lots of chilling centers are being added en route so the quality of milk with respect to bacterial growth is being by and large taken care but then as they said a lot of improvement is needed because infrastructure etc and as i said once production side uh, proper care is taken and then when it's when it comes to processing again a lot of things need to be done to improve the quality and safety and even one us lies on the retailers that's the reason why uh, fssa mentions that everyone who handles food not the person who is just manufacturing even the retailer has owners he is also considered as food business operator in case a consumer finds that he is not following the normal guidelines or practices package of practices he could be penalized by the concerned authorities as i have said implementation is a one big thing we have a good act we have good traffic acts as well but you know how who has to implement this people concerned and then all the concerned regulatory authorities need to maintain that having said this coming straight away to the question that you have asked well contaminants you know many of the contaminants especially the pesticides and antibiotic residues are necessary evils you cannot really control them as mr preet said over the world this is an issue it's not that only india has this problem and fssa only lists some contaminants etc when you use pesticides in agricultural production some of the residues that remain on the plant edible portions and when the animal eats them then animal ingests those pesticides and then they come into uh, you know all food products livestock food products including poultry meat milk etc and then similarly when animal is suffering from an infectious disease you cannot simply say i don't want antibiotic residues in milk so i'll not inject you with any antibiotics animal needs health care so when animal is injected with some antibiotic residues especially those who are suffering from mastitis the antibiotic is directly infused into the mammary gland so some of these residues are expected to come into milk but having said this you know pesticide residues and uh, antibiotic residues considering that they are necessary evils FSSA or Codex Alimentarius or many countries the legal regulation stipulates MRLs that is this particular residue should not be more than this particular limit that limit is based on some safety concerns that is even when they are present they do not cause any kind of health hazard to the human beings who consume such foods it is not pertaining to milk alone for example some time back some survey which was done showed that fruits and vegetables contain are more contaminated with pesticide residues than milk is fortunately for us cow or a buffalo or whomsoever it is whomsoever is lactating animal is an excellent biological filter if the pesticide residues are fed through feed most of it goes to flesh and other areas and very very small quantity comes to milk probably that is the mother nature's gift to the offspring mother takes care of the milk in in in, in the formation of biological filtration anyway uh if you look at uh, the contamination and other things i'll not go into the details uh, having done a per, per, I mean a very uh, very sensible research and then through research and development across the world uh, what are the likely contaminants that can be present in milk or listed by fssa for example metal contaminants the so called heavy metals like arsenic mercury lead and all such things wherever they are possible to be present in milk FSSA with in in accordance with codex have given MRLs that is it should not be more than this particular limit MRL means maximum residue limit and similarly FSSA has listed about 213 pesticide residues in total foods and 55 of them pertain to milk and milk products of these 213 pesticide residues milk and milk products are listed with 55 residues that means these 55 residues if at all present in milk and milk products shall be lower than the mrl which is a safe limit similarly 100 103 veterinary drug residues including that of antibiotic residues are listed by fssa and uh, milk you know if you see 98 of them are listed for milk because these veterinary drugs are given to animals some of them may be lactating and they could be present in milk so they have listed that these 98 veterinary drug residues including 25 antibiotic residues shall be present lower than mrls so if they are present that means it's a legal violation and similarly as uh, you know others have mentioned that uh, feed not fodder mainly feed especially the contaminated or the moist wheat and grains etc can harbor fungi the so called mold this mold can cause the production of a toxin called fungal toxin called b1 
when this contaminated feed is consumed by the animals then this b1 is converted to m1 which is very very dangerous so even for that a limit is kept in in india generally one particular thing is mentioned is if the grain is unsuitable for human beings it could go as feed for the animals forgetting the fact that animal also is a biological uh, you know living organism and then it produces good quality food for us and all sorts of uh, useless feed or fodder cannot be given to uh, you know the animals and uh, melamine i will not talk about it it was an adult trend in china you know 2008 9 that big um, this thing was there in india fortunately such a kind of situation doesn't arise but uh, you know nevertheless fssc has limited even melamine in especially in infant foods now you know we consider that contaminants come because of pre production or production um, kind of lacune maybe a particular farmer is um, spraying the field with unnecessarily pesticides and those that contaminate milk and milk products or whatever it is yeah that could be one of the major reasons we have seen that the major source of pesticide residues in milk and milk products is because of the feed the contamination of feed can occur because of two reasons one is because of harvesting the practices that follow that are followed in pesticide use secondly many a times even these so called feed factories uh, to store the feed grain etc which are collected during um, the seasonal uh, production and then when they are kept for long time they use pesticides uh, to you know kind of extend the shelf life some of the people may also see that in some places like haryana and punjab farmers spray gamaxin so called gamaxin on the wheat bags to avoid uh, infestation with red ants etc so this kind of contamination this is called post harvest contamination could also lead to the contamination of milk and milk products then uh, what are the measures uh, in addition to this pesticides antibiotics aflatoxin heavy metals you ask what could be the other uh, uh, you know contaminants that contaminants can be of any type even in processing when you use a detergents and sanitizer and if it is not properly cleaned or rinsed or sanitized or you know kind of uh, removing of those detergents and sanitizer residues they could occur, they could be present in milk and milk products so that is the reason why good manufacturing practices are essential to reduce the level of contamination similarly if you don't use a proper packing material some of the packing my packaging migrants like phthalates could enter into uh, milk and milk products that is the reason why legislation always also stipulates what kind of packing material should be used and what kind of ink should be used for labeling etc so that this type of contamination does not occur in milk and milk products or to that matter of fact any food and food products so some of the measures to contain these residues or contaminants as i mentioned is good agricultural practices integrated pest management good veterinary practices good manufacturing practices and above all that uh, you know proper regulatory mechanism and one more thing we have been advocating is instead of saying that this particular food or milk in particular has got lots of pesticide residues etc and as i said feed is the important source of pesticide residue contamination in milk why not fix mrls in feed itself you know the compound feed the concentrated feed that is available in the market we do not have mrls for the pesticide residues in those feed so when you keep or when you fix legal limits for pesticide residues in feeds considering that cows or buffaloes are also important in our uh, you know food chain that even their health is important not only the foods that we consume that come out of these animals even their health is important so if we fix mrls and proper management practices like good agricultural practices how much pesticide to be used and what stage it should be used and when you can harvest that particular thing and when you use an antibiotic to the animal how long you should withhold the milk these practices are already there but if you implement them in real sense then the contamination of milk and milk products with these type of contaminants pesticide residues antibiotic residues aflatoxins heavy metals could be considerably reduced and then when we follow good manufacturing practices the other possible residues or contaminants that could be present like you know detergents and sanitizers and certain other processing contaminants and packaging contaminants could be greatly reduced in our food and food products milk and milk products including thank you thank you sir so the next question is to mr prasant here uh, we did hear uh, mr dr surendra nath talking about uh, the contaminants from the chemicals and all those things right and lactose something is there in the milk and there are uh, products uh, which are there which is without the lactose so uh, you know so now uh, to have the lactose free 
milk. How do you ensure that there is no contamination, cross contamination during the production time? Sure, sure. So, so <laughs> lactose free milk is is uh, currently a small uh, product segment, and it is growing quite strongly. I think twenty five thirty percent year on year, since the base is small. Uh, I'm not very sure about the the lactose intolerance uh, um, occurrence in in India. Like how many people are really affected uh, with lactose intolerance? Um, but there can be like two ways of uh, making milk uh, lactose free. One would be the usage of uh, enzyme lactase uh, that converts lactose into glucose and galactose, thereby making it. Uh, 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 lactose free or you can use a filtration method ultra filtration that doesn't allow the lactose molecules to pass through uh, so these are two uh, two ways it can be done um, so in india i do not think that there are there are filtration uh, units uh, available with any of the manufacturers to to uh, remove lactose um, but lactase is a easier uh, way the usage of enzyme is a easier way to make uh, milk lactose free uh, as far as the the cross contamination is concerned see uh, once uh, so you need to um, um, treat this uh, this milk with the lactase enzyme for around 8 to 10 hours and after that it is um, heat treated so during the heat treatment the lactase enzyme gets uh, deactivated um as far as the cross contamination is concerned there there are there are ways like you have um, very well established cip processes in place in in, in the dairy industry uh, so that can be taken care uh, easily um, by ensuring that the, the proper cip uh, happens but currently it is only a very small uh, market in india and we in mother dairy have not at looked at uh, uh, this this opportunity because um, like it is it is quite small so far okay yeah so maybe uh, you know slowly looking at that uh, this sector as well the saying that people are getting aware about allergens about the lactose intolerance and all the stuff so hopefully that's a new business opportunity that you can go for so uh, uh, some of the countries like um, there are offerings so made up of soy etc or the plant protein uh, based beverages but in india that taste is not liked right yeah, yeah. Uh, this is sector if you, if you may uh, permit you know about lactose intolerance i would like to mention something about uh, yes sir sure can i sure 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 go ahead please sir yeah one sec yeah uh Mr. Prashant was mentioning about uh, uh, lack of information about lactose intolerance. There is a survey which shows that every second individual individual in India suffers from so-called lactose intolerance. Uh, that means uh, every second individual after taking milk should be suffering from you know abdominal pain, uh, typically diarrhea, etc. But we hardly see any such individual in the family or among uh, people known to us suffering from lactose intolerance, because the test actually says that you have to take 50 grams of lactose on an empty stomach, and then they analyze breath hydrogen after uh, you know a freak, I mean after some time. Uh, breath hydrogen typically increases in lactose intolerant individuals, and once it rises to a particular level from the base level, base level hydrogen. then they say he is suffering from lactose intolerance but as i have said the test itself uh, involves ingestion of 50 grams of lactose which is equal to 1 liter of milk uh, in india most of the people do not take 1 liter of milk in one go at the most we may take about 8 ounces which is also a serving size by who that is about 240 ml one glass of milk so therefore uh, lactose intolerance per se uh, when compared to milk protein allergy is not a serious issue in our india in our country but uh, having said that there may be some individuals who really suffer from lactose intolerance so for them definitely lactose free milk is needed so amul and many other uh, dairies have started producing there are two types reduced lactose that is 70% lactose is reduced and then lactose free milk which is 99% 99.9% lactose free milk and even in a scientific panel of milk and milk products fssa has approved uh, you know kind of production of such uh, 
commercial uh, production of lactose free milk and lactose reduced milk for those who are suffering from um, lactose intolerance so this is only lactose free milk or lactose reduced milk is not for all the individuals who do not have this problem those who have a manifestation of uh, diarrhea or any such uh, abdominal discomfort after taking milk they only need to kind of go for this type of lactose free or lactose reduced milk thank you thank you sir so that was a great insight so moving to you uh, preet uh, like uh, uh, dr surendra nath did explain the difference between a uh, reduced lactose and a lactose free so uh, just a brief if you can take us through saying like the difference between your greek yogurt probiotic prebiotic frozen and your high protein yogurt that you guys manufacture out there you are on mute uh, preet you might have to unmute yourself mm -hmm. yeah sorry um so i'll take you to uh, so we uh, we make the uh, manufacture uh, greek yogurt prebiotic frozen and all, oh sorry high protein and uh, also lactose free yogurt uh, so the greek and uh, prebiotic yogurt is the process overall manufacturing process is quite similar only difference is uh, different uh, raw materials ingredients are added um uh, pre pasto uh, pre pasteurizer and also um the different uh, live uh, stock cultures are added so the process is first you, when you receive the milk from a farm you standardize the milk to your certain fat levels and this may reduce your protein so that so that then we we the transfer the milk into a different tank and from there we standardize um in that tank uh whatever the final of product uh, should be like in in terms of protein uh, fat and all that and once that's done the milk is put through pasteurizer and uh, uh there's uh as it is quality and food safety standard we need to follow and um so during that transfer we uh, uh in introduce live cultures um to our yogurt and then um the different uh, yogurt may have different fermentation time so which we monitor by the ph level and once the ph level is uh, achieved so we usually most of the fermentation are between 38 and 42 degrees and is monitored and is monitored by the automation system if so we it throughout the process if we ever um, lose our parameters we, it will alarm so uh, and then um then the yogurt as soon as the ph level is uh, achieved uh it is the yogurt is cool to stop the fermentation so we you not know, overcooking or that's when you taste the sour taste in the yogurt and uh from there on uh, yogurt is um after the cooling stage and yogurt can be uh, sent to the filler to pack so this describes greek prebiotic um um and um lactose free yogurt so with the high protein yogurt so it's same same way as at home we will make a paneer so you'll just need to get rid of the whey so after the yogurt is fermented so instead of cooling it down we actually send it to a centrifugal separation which all it does is takes the whey out and increase the concentration of the protein so it's till the fermentation all the process is the same and from there instead of going to another chiller we actually go to a centrifugal separator and we have a, the ratio is around 3 uh, to 1 so three parts uh, will go into whey and one part uh, will go as, as the yogurt and we end up around 10 10 to 11% of protein in our final product and after the separation we cool it and then the same process again we can send with different flavors and yeah oh that's a, like a whole lot of uh, activities that you guys have to do to make a different varieties of yoga that you guys yeah but it's that. pretty straight forward like once you know the basic it's like just like making a paneer you make a yogurt and then you put a weight on it we do it through a centrifugal separation mhm mm that's that's good thank you that's Yeah. So uh, uh, next uh, for Mr. Milton. Uh, so uh, we did talk about the temperature abuses that happen. Uh, you know, once the product leaves our factories. Uh, so uh, you know, if you have to look at the packaging material and all those, 
uh, definitely there's issue of tampering. You do hear people saying like with the injection, they put the milk, uh, water in to dilute it at the, you know, retailer level and all those things. So uh, what, what kind of solutions are available to avoid these tampering? And uh, if it's detected, how do you get it back to your production uh, to rule out the process failures? <clears throat> well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, when we say how to control the tempering in the market, uh, to ensure that we first need to ensure that what we are giving to the market is not a leaky one, right? So if you talk of pouch milk, the poly uh, pack milk, uh, we have our own check system at the uh, point of packing. Our operators are trained enough to uh, check it. Then uh, there are machines now available. There are machines who can detect the leakages. It passes through the pouches after packing, passes through the machine, and the machine is able to detect the leakages. So that way we ensure that uh, leaky packets do not go to our cold room. Then from the cold room, uh, at the time of dispatch, uh, the packets are once again segregated to ensure that the leaky packets uh, are not going to the market. Still, uh, there are leakages in the uh, vehicle during transportation. There are possibilities of leakages. Those are not delivered to retailers. They are taken back by the dairy as the leaky packets. This all activities ensure that uh, to minimize the leak, uh, leaky packets going to the uh, market. Now, uh, beyond that, when we talk of tempering of packets, uh, with our experience, we are able to know because the dairy milk packets get leaked from a few places. Those who have worked in dairy plant will, uh, will be very easily able to uh, identify the kind of leakage, whether it is from the vertical seal or the horizontal seal. There is a pattern of leakage always. If somebody is just injecting, we will be able to know because uh, uh, it, uh, when the leakage is from the factory, it is always in a standard place. Anybody who has handled the packing machine will uh, be able to understand. Now, uh, we do have some cases of uh, tempering of uh, pouches, which we take up with the retailer uh, uh, to ensure and we take actions, we put penalty on them for uh, non-logical uh, claim on leakages. So, uh, and secondly, uh, there is one more thing. If somebody uh, puts a pin on the uh, pouch milk and takes out the milk, he will not be able to seal it again. It's not very easy. It's not very easy to seal it back. So, this is more a theoretical thing than actually a practical problem. Otherwise, so many uh, industries in pouch milk would not have been able to sell uh, all across India. But we need to ensure that leakages do not go to the market so that whatever complaint comes, we are able to identify why it has happened. This is about the poly pack milk. Well, regarding other products, Generally, we have a secondary packaging, right? We have the primary packaging and the secondary packaging. No one can damage, no, no one can temper with the primary packaging without tempering with the secondary pack, right? So we try to uh, check there. We have no other solution to this except for just checking the packet under complaint and trying to locate the regions. When a professional, when a person from the factory goes to the market and checks is very easily is able to identify whether the whether it is a real leakage from the factory or it's a tempering so it should not be a big challenge in my opinion that's, that's 
great to hear. So uh, we have, uh, so now I think we are towards the end of our session. So we would like to take a few questions from our, you know, uh, viewers out there who have been listening to us. So I think there's a question uh, from Mr. Nagis Swara Rao, uh, who says, can you please, please share proposed insulated crates that you are using? I think that question is for Mr. Prasan. So would you like to address that? I didn't get the question fully. Um, uh, it says, can you please share the proposed insulated crates that you are using? So I think maybe the type of insulated crates that you're using or that yeah, you yeah, are yeah. in plan uh, for, yeah. uh, you know, your dispatches. So, so, yeah, basically this, this insulated crates would have, um, would have a, a insulated foam in between the, the walls of the, um, um, the crate. So it is on, on all sides, bottom as well as on side walls, you've got this uh, uh, insulation foam and it would have a lid on it that also has an insulation foam. So if you keep, so normally the, the, the pouch milk is uh, while, while packing, the temperature is around say three to four degrees centigrade. And if you keep it in these trays, um, it can remain say below say seven to eight degrees centigrade. Even if you are exposing it to ambient condition uh, for nearly uh, 10 to 12 hours. So the temperature doesn't rise beyond eight degrees centigrade for 10 to 12 hours, okay. but they are expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, so the other question is for you, Mr. Milton, wherein uh, they say, saying like we all know, right, during winter season, the production of our milk goes lower. How do you manage your supply and demand during those times? <laughs> well, uh, uh, in summertime, milk procurement goes down and the milk requirement in the market goes up. Now, we, we have to uh, anticipate this and we need to prepare ourselves. Of course, we are using milk powders to some level, maybe up to 20%. Uh, these seasonal fluctuations, we, need to, uh, we have to manage through the uh, uh, milk powders. But there are some uh, places in the country, like West Bengal, uh, when uh, it's a summer time in Bihar and Jharkhand and there is less milk, there is more milk in West Bengal. So we the, the movement of milk from one part of the country to another country, uh, part of the country also helps in meeting that shortages. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we are definitely running out of time. I would take up one last question. Uh, definitely, yes, we have like many, many questions, which we will put it across maybe later to individuals and then try answering those. But then the last question here uh, from Dr. Sussikant uh, to you, Mr. Prasan, uh, do you monitor sodium level? Okay, so if so, can you highlight the actions that you guys take? Yes, we, we uh, sodium uh, testing is part of uh, the, those more than 30 tests that we do. Uh, for every batch of uh, raw milk. Um, and there's a limit for that um, because cow milk naturally contains certain level of uh, sodium. Um, I think the limit is around 600 or 700 ppm. Uh, so it is tested and beyond 700, the milk is rejected. Okay, yeah, yeah. so. So cow, cow milk naturally contains, I think around 600 ppm of uh, sodium. I think, yeah, uh, it has been a great session. I would like to thank, uh, you know, everyone out here uh, who has agreed to be on our panel. And uh, the best thing about this conversation, I think, has been that we got to hear from a panel that brought a variety of insight. And hopefully to all our viewers, the insights were useful, helpful, uh, definitely, yes, the conversation wouldn't have been successful without our panel members who took the time out here to share their insights. Uh, thank you, all our panelists, uh, you know, for spending your valuable time with us. And if I may wrap uh, the whole session, definitely the infrastructure plays a major, major role in the whole system. A happy cow definitely, you know, gives you a better quality milk. The fodder plays a major role, saying like what type of fodder you are giving. It's not the rejected fodder that you give your, uh, 
you know, animal, the milk producing animals, but it has to be also a good quality fodder that you uh, give it to your uh, milk producing animals. Along with that, the innovations have to go hand in hand. If there are no innovations, definitely somebody else is smarter than you uh, with adultering your milk and definitely which affects your finished product. Right, so as we continue with our monthly conversation series, do share uh, your feedback on our email ID, which is feedback at foodsafetyworks.in. And if there are any topics that you would like us to cover, please do send them to us, uh, you know, so that we will try to bring it to them to you. Uh, to stay updated on our conversations, please do subscribe channel you can also follow us on our social medias the fb linkedin insta twitter and our handle is food safety works we regularly share news and insights about what is going all around the world in terms of food safety and as a company we are committed to providing end-to-end -end solutions for food safety we also conduct regular online trainings on various topics, including our post-act trainings as per FSSAI mandate. So to check out how we can help you on your journey, please do visit our website, which is www.foodsafetyworks.com. While you are there, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you all once again for joining. Have a good rest of the day. Safe times ahead. Thank, Thank you, you all once again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank